Let's see, let's see your Bibles today. Let's see your Bibles today. Say word. word. One more time. Say word. word. Let's see your pens. Lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. If you have the Bible I have, it's page 345. Job chapter 1. When I uh, first got saved, I, my first Bible study I shared was this story, 1985, training camp with the charges. And training camp is when a lot of guys go to chapel because they don't want to get cut from the team. <laughs> so I had a good captive audience. <laughs> Job chapter 1, right before Psalms. Lord, thank you so much for your, for your word, and I pray you encourage us and challenge us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in my hand, I have three tea bags. Tea bag number one. Tea bag number two. And tea bag number three. And none of these tea bags have labels on them. So I have no idea what kind of tea they are. And the only way I can know what kind of tea they are is to put them in hot water. Christians are the same way. You know, we can say, praise the Lord, word, Jesus. <laughs> Carry your Bible. You can come to church all looking all good, all dressed up, which is not really the case too much on at the Rock. <laughs> we're casual, we're casual. I'm just, I'm just saying, we're just casual. But when you get put in hot water is when we really know what kind of faith you have and what kind of relationship you have. As we continue the series called Why Do Bad Things Happen, today we're going to look at a story about a man named Job. Everyone say Job. The Bible says that Job was a good man. He was a righteous man. He shunned evil. He gave evil to Heisman. He had ten kids. That means he got along with his wife. He was very, he was very wealthy. He had a lot of camels, sheep, ox, etc., etc., etc. But we're going to see that something very bad happened to him. And when this bad thing happened to him, he had a response that is indicative of his righteousness. Many times when people think, why do bad things happen, we always look at us and we start complaining to God about why it happened. And instead of asking, what is our response, what does it really show about who we are? Because how you respond in your trial shows more about you than about God. So as we read the story, I want you to think about what you're going through. And I promise you, none of you probably have had happen to you as happened to him. But most importantly, I want you to check out his response. Amen? Amen. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. It says, there, wasn't a man of, there was a man in the land of Uz. Everyone say Uz. Uz. Say Uz. Uz. Whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Now watch this. I'm going to say Job was a good man. Watch this. Job was a good man. On three, I want you to say Job was a good man. Have your shoulders go up. One, two, three. Job was a good man. Come on. Oh, man, that was weak. <laughs> everyone do it everyone do on three. One, two, three. Job was a good man. Can y'all, like, to the ears, to the ears. Some of y'all just doing, like, you know, if you want to get these bad boys to sit up like little puppies, you got to get them all the way up to your ears, okay? Let's call your traps right here. You want to get the little pop-up, okay? One, two, three, Job was a good man. Very good. One more time, I want you to look at the people around you. Look how funny they look. One, two, three, Job was a good man. There you go. There you go. There you go. Isn't that fun? Okay? So the Bible says Job was righteous. Now, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not good. This guy was blameless. He wasn't perfect. The Bible says there's none righteous, there's no perfect. This was as good as you get. Look what it says next. Job had seven sons and three daughters. That means he had ten kids. So him and his wife, they didn't have cable. Number three. <laughs> also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, a bunch of servants. So this man was the greatest of all in the east. This, this story is so old that they measured wealth by animals, not gold and silver. So he had a bunch of animals, he was wealthy, he had a lot of kids, and he was very righteous. And then it says in verse 4, his sons would go feast in, that, in their houses each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was when the feast, days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. He'd rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did on a regular basis. 
So basically, he had a lot of animals, which he was wealthy. He had 10 kids. His kids got along. Whenever one had a party, they would all go over to the sibling's house and have a party. So his kids got along. He got along with his wife. And then when his kids had a party, he would say, it might be that one of my kids sinned. So he would go outside, kill an animal, and sacrifice to God and say, God, please forgive my son or my daughter. That's a righteous man. Can I get an Amen. I don't know if any of you have ever sacrificed an animal in your yard to, to the God of heaven because of what your kids might have done. Can I get uh, anybody? Please don't do that. The, the cops will come and put you in jail. <laughs> so we got, a, we got an idea what kind of guy he was. He's righteous. He has a lot of kids. He's wealthy. He's done everything right, all by the book, and he worships God. He worships God. Okay? Verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So God has a staff meeting. He doesn't send out an email. He doesn't send out a memo. He doesn't tell his secretary to notify everybody. He just thinks, I need all my angels here. And immediately, none of them are late. They're right before him. And Satan's there. Satan used to be an angel. He got kicked out of heaven, but now he's, he's a devil. But he comes to the meeting. Now, I wonder what the rumor was around the water cooler after the meeting was, you know, what was Satan doing there? Is he going to repent? Is he coming back, trying to get his job back? You know, I don't know. I, I wasn't there, but... It must, been, it must have been pretty interesting. So Satan's there, and it says, The Lord said to Satan, Where do you come from? Satan said to the Lord, From going to and afro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. I've been walking around the earth, God, checking out your people, checking out your creation, seeing who I can mess with, seeing all these people that you made in the image of God, and, and, and look at your little images walking around, and I've been looking for someone who I can destroy. That's what he does day and night, and his demons do day and night. Walking around the earth, he got kicked out of heaven like lightning. And then it says, verse 8, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Lord, I hope I never get to that status where you talk to Satan, the devil, about me like that. I'm trying to be righteous, but I don't want to be that righteous. He says, Satan, I know you're always tempting people, always lying to people, trying to get, you know, get them to uh, turn on me. But my man Job, not him. He will not fall for your tricks. By the way, the devil speaks three times in the Bible. He speaks in Genesis chapter 3. He speaks in Job chapter 1. He speaks in Matthew chapter 4. And each time the devil speaks, he's trying to accomplish one thing. is It's to destroy the relationship between man and God. He speaks in Genesis chapter 3. And he says, Adam and Eve, God lied to you. We're going to see him speak in Job chapter 1 where he's going to say to God, Job is using you. We'll see that in a minute. And then he speaks to, in, in Matthew chapter 4 to the God man, fall down and worship me. The devil, when it, no matter what he promises you, no matter what he tells you, all he's trying to accomplish is to get you to turn your back on God. He knows if you have no relationship with God, you're no good. You're doomed. So all he wants to do is destroy your relationship with God however he can. So he said, look what he says to God. God. He says to God in verse 9, Satan said, does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Number one in your notes. Huh. What blessing? Or blessings do you feel entitled to from your relationship with God? Let's think about this. Don't raise your hand. Don't think. You can write them down on your piece of paper if you want to help you reflect on it later. But what do you think God owes you? Well, God owes me a man. <laughs> I want to... <clears throat> God owes me a man. I want a fine man. My man needs to have a six-pack, all his teeth, and a good job. God owes me a woman. God owes me two cars. God owes me a house. God owes me a baby. God owes me a healthy life. God owes me a raise every year. What does God owe you? Think about it. Before you respond... Because I think all of us think God owes us something because when we don't get it, we complain. And if you think God owes you life, God owes you long life, God owes you health, God owes you no sickness, no cancer, if you think that, you and God need to have a conversation. 
Because God doesn't think he owes you anything. Nothing at all. The Bible says you're saved by grace, not by works or merit. It's a gift of God. The Bible says that God loves you and, and forgives you and walks with you and blesses you because of grace. Grace is undeserved favor. Everyone say undeserved. undeserved. Undeserved means undeserved. You don't deserve it. He don't owe it to you. You didn't earn it. You can't pay him back for it. Uh, let me say that again. You didn't earn it. You can't pay him back. Well, God, look at all this good stuff I did. I should get this. Nope. I prayed for something for many years to God. I'm still praying for it. I've been in tears praying for it. And I, and I don't think I asked for God a, a lot of things from God. I don't think that are for me. But this is something I said to God, God, I know you don't owe me anything, but I'm going to tell you a conversation I have with God, and, and, and I, I confess to God as I was having this conversation, I know I'm wrong, but please just let me say this. I do all this for you. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. I do this, I do this, I do this, and God, I don't ask for a lot, but can I have this? And I was crying while I was saying this, so I was very upset, and I was very hurt, and I was very frustrated, and I was just like, I got to say this. And God was like, yeah, he was listening. He said, no, I don't owe you that either. And everything you do for me, I do. And the only reason you get to do it is because of me. And if you weren't doing that, you wouldn't be doing anything more important than that. I, I know all that, but I had a vent. So the question you have to ask yourself what does God owe you? And if you really, really clearly with a sober mind say God doesn't owe me anything, then he can do anything he wants to you. Or he can allow anything to happen to you because you're on borrowed time as you are. And so how you respond to your pain is going to tell you what you think God owes you. And how you respond to your pain is going to tell you how you view God. Is God serving you or are you serving him? Is God all-knowing or are you all-knowing? Is God all-righteous or are you all-righteous? And so here's Job. Job has all this wealth. He is a righteous man. He has all these kids. And, and something, something is going great and ready to happen to him. Look what it says in verse 10. Verse, uh, verse 11. Verse 11 says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. God, this is Satan talking to God, uh, Job is using you. Job is using you. You know how people are using God? When they don't get what they want, they complain to God. In other words, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to pray, I'm going to do my thing so I can get this. And so you go to church, you do all, and then you don't get what you want, and then here's what comes into your mind. I do all this for God, and I'm not getting this. That's what I was caught at. And, I, and believe me, what... I was praying for someone's soul was what I was praying for. It wasn't like, God, I want, you know, material things. It was somebody's soul. God, I want this person's soul converted, and it was killing me that they weren't converted. And I was like, can I just have that? Am I, is that such a bad thing to ask for? And, 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 and make a long story short, he says, you just be patient, young man. But if, if you're doing things so you can get something for your pocket, get something for your stature, or get something for you, then you know your motive. And that's exactly what the devil's saying. He's saying those people are using you. Look at those people going to rock. They're using you, God. Some of these guys in here are just here to look for a woman. Now, by the way, uh, if you're going to look for a woman, here's a good place to look for it in church. <laughs> I ain't lying. You want to get a godly woman. Let me see. You want to get a godly don't, don't go to the club. Don't go to the club. Come to church, you know, praise the Lord. Okay, okay, I get that. I get that. <laughs> Just pursue it with prayer. <laughs> Don't get all ghetto on them and, you know, yo, girl, what's your name? You know, no, 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 that. <laughs> Luke says in verse 10, uh, verse, verse 11, Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Number two in your notes. What attitude toward God resulted from your last trial? 
These two questions are very closely related. Because if you say, well, God doesn't owe me anything, but the last time I didn't get my way, I stomped on the ground like a little kid, something's wrong. Because if God owes you nothing, then nothing bad can happen. Now, it doesn't mean you don't want something good to happen. It doesn't mean you can't be upset that it doesn't happen, but you can't blame God. Last week, we, we started this series called Why Do Bad Things Happen? And we saw that God created everything good. He created the earth good. He created all the animals good. He created everything good. And then he created man, and man was good. But he gave man the freedom to choose good or evil. And we saw last week in Genesis chapter 3 that man, Adam and Eve, chose evil. And therefore, sinners, which they became, beget sinners. They have baby sinners, and they have baby sinners, and here we are. It wasn't God's fault. So stuff is going to happen. But the minute you say God doesn't owe me anything and then something happens that you don't like because somebody evil did something to you and then you blame God, somehow those two things are disconnected. And so he is a righteous God who is all good, gooder than we can imagine. <laughs> I know it's not a word. Gooder than we can imagine. And then something happens in your life that you don't like. Do you curse God? How did you respond last time you didn't get your way? I go to church. I give my money. Gave five dollars. I know they need thirty-eight million, but I gave five. So what's up? And and I didn't get a parking space. I had to wait. In the, I, you know, I called and Miles didn't pick up the phone. Miles ain't picking up the phone. I ain't a one-on-one. That -on -one. ain't going to happen. I'm trying to get a one-on-one -on -one with my wife. <laughs> I ain't get what I wanted. Hmm. That was your attitude. What was your attitude last time you didn't get your way? Did you blame God? I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to church. I'm not giving money. I'm not going to pray for anybody. I'm not going to forgive anybody. Matter of fact, I'm going to go out and get out. That was your attitude. That's exactly what the devil said you would do. That's exactly what the devil said you would do. And guess what the devil did? While you were doing it, he says, God, look at that hypocrite right there. And God said, yeah, I know. I know. But I'm still praying for them. So, first question, what does God owe you? Answer that question first. If you say he owes you stuff, don't ask. You need to, you need to clarify that. You need to verify that he really does owe you something. Doesn't. He graciously gives us to us. And whatever you think God owes you, he lovingly wants to give you more than that. But he'll give it to you when you're ready. When I was a kid, we used to get whooped. How many of y'all got whooped as kids? Okay, very good. That's why we all turned out the great citizens we are. All of us who are clapping used to do drugs and do all kind of wild stuff. But, but after all that, we became great citizens. They didn't have child protective services in my neighborhood. As a child, you don't know your rights. You just know you get whooped. Where, where can you go for Who's your advocate as a child? My father was a cop, so I was double, I was double messed up. He, he, he's a cop. I call the cops. He answers the phone. We're in the grocery st uh, department store, five kids. I, I have an older sister, an older younger sister, and two younger brothers, all within six years, five kids in six years. So my mother, it was like, you know, the, 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 the goose with all the little chicks following, five of us. Well, this particular day, my father was with us. And so not only was he mad because all five of us were there, he, we were in the store. <laughs> he don't like the shop. Men don't like the shop. For the most part, I'm generalizing, but can I get amen, fellas? Amen. There you go. So we're in the store, and there's a kid in the store going, Aah! We never in my life, and I am not exaggerating, not exaggerating, in my house ever one time did that. It might have happened when we were really, really, really little because we don't remember, but it got smacked out of us. So we're in the store, and we're all looking at this kid going, when is the whooping coming? <laughs> it's like, get on the floor. 
<laughs> and then, come on, Johnny. I don't know where this woman, oh, I don't remember, it was a woman, a guy, whatever. And, I, and my father's, we're all like, the, all the six of us, the five kids and the dad, we're all looking at this kid going, when's the woman coming? And then all of a sudden, there was no woman. So my father's like, someone's getting a whooping. And he started whooping us. <laughs> Like, what do we do? We didn't do nothing. <laughs> he didn't want us to get an image in our head <laughs> and think we can do that. <laughs> Something happens that we don't like, and we start doing this to God. And God's like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> You're complaining to me? You know the only reason you have breath is because of me? You know the only reason... You were created in the womb because of me. You know who formed you in the womb? Me. Everything. I gave you everything you have. And so you have to ask yourself, whatever you're going through, it could be horrible. It could be horrible. But before you start blaming, uh, I, I, was, I went to Liberty University. Jerry Falwell started Liberty University. It's a 500-acre campus. It's one of the most incredible thing, places I've ever been in my life. I went there for the first time two years ago or so, and I stayed at the, in a house. They have a guest house where, they, where, the, where the guests come. I was there to speak at the, at the chapel, and right outside the house, in that house was his office, and right outside that house is where he's buried. And when I went, I was stressed. I was discouraged. I was going through stuff, and I was just not in a good place. Actually, I was in the perfect place. I just didn't, didn't feel good. And I went out to his grave, put everything in perspective. He's dead. And right by his grave is a wall with all these plaques of sayings from Jerry Falwell. One of the plaques said, a man is measured. I don't remember exactly. The greatness of a man or something is measured by what it takes to discourage him. I remember looking at that plaque crying because I was discouraged. And this little voice says, that's all it's going to take to discourage you? And the guy who took us around the two days I was there, he was Jerry Falwell's right-hand man for 30 years. He started tell I asked him about that plaque. He started telling me stories about incredible trials that they went through. Incredible. And he said he was never discouraged. He just never showed it at least. And God is looking at us going, don't you think I could take care of all this? I love you so much. And so when something happens you don't like, you have to put everything in perspective of who's you belong, who you belong to. So here's what happened. The devil, who is very strategic and very powerful and very intelligent and very conniving, he gets Job. But I want to, as I read this to you, I want you to, to notice how timely the devil is. How many of you have ever had something bad happen to you and you're like, why is it happening now? This is the worst time. <laughs> Watch this. Verse 13. There was a day when his sons, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And the messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were feeding beside them, when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, and indeed have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking... Another also came and said the Chaldeans formed three bands and raided the camels and took them away and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Job was sitting in his house watching ESPN. Or something. He's doing something. He's got his big, big ponderosa, all these acres, thousands of animals, and, and he's got four quadrants of his estate. And he's a godly man. He shuns evil. Uh, uh, he's blameless. He's got ten kids. And he's sitting there minding his own business, worshiping God. And someone comes running, Joe, 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 the Chaldeans came, and they took all the animals, they took the ox. And while the words are coming out of that guy's mouth, he says, Joe, everybody's dead where he was. 
Another guy comes in, Job, 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 the fire of God came down and killed all the ox and everybody's dead. I'm the only one that escaped. Another said, while the words are coming out of his mouth, Job, 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 the Chaldeans came and took all the camels. While the words are coming out of his mouth, Job, 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 all your kids are dead. Boom, 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 boom. Out of all his land, the devil struck and killed everything except one messenger to come tell Job the news. And he had him time where they would come while they were still speaking. And Job was sitting there. Job could have complained. He says, I worship God. My kids are godly. I shun evil. I'm blameless. I'm a good man. And God does this to me? That's not what he said. Look what it says in verse 20. Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and he worshiped. Everyone say worship. That's a righteous man. Let's look what he says. Oh, by the way, you say, well, I ain't a righteous man. I ain't worshiping. Well, that's the problem. If you're a righteous man, what does God owe you then? Why should God even listen to your prayers? Look what it says next. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin nor charge, charge God with any wrong. I understand life can be hard. This is hard, no doubt. Can I get an amen? But I also understand that God is bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your pain. And he wants to get you through. And sometimes the only way you're going to see God's hand, his face, his power is when you cry out the loudest to him. It's when you need him the most. Right after this, Satan came back and said, let me touch his body. And God let Satan touch his body. And his wife said to Job, curse God and die. Why do you hold your integrity? And I'm sure Job said, why did I marry you? You don't want curse God and die people in your life. You want people in your life who are going to pray for you, encourage you, and tell you God is faithful. Because we all know wherever you're at in your trial, your pain graph, we all know that God is faithful. Can I get an amen? How many of y'all thought at some point in your life, your life was over? Say, God, take me. I'm ready to go. I don't like this. This is too hard. Can I, get a, can I raise a hand? God got you through. God gets you through. But so you say, why, why, why? For a whole lot of reasons. A whole lot of reasons God will do it. Well, one of them is to get you on your knees. To get you, well, why would God want me on my knees? Because that's the way he wants you to stay. People come to me, oh, Pastor, please pray. Pastor, please, this is going, I'm going through this, I'm going through this. I'm saying, well, what's your life like now that you're going through all that? I'm praying every day. I've been fasting. I've been reading my Bible every day. And, and I'm like, really? So we want the trial to go away. So you can go back to not doing that? Don't miss it. What God wants to do in your life is what's happening in your life. And by the way, you worshiping him is way more important than your comfort. God has not promised to make you happy. He's not committed to making you happy. He wants to make you holy. And unfortunately, because we are hard-headed, we are hard-hearted, Sometimes he's trying to rip something out of your hand that's painful to take because you won't let it go. There are these four kids on my street. They're nine years old and down. They're the cutest kids in the world. And I want them to come swim in my pool because I got a slide that we don't slide down anymore. <laughs> now, you guys got to come on my house and, and slide down. My slide is fast and boom, it goes faster. And they're like, Mom, Mom, we want to go to Mr. Miles' house and slide in the pool. So I, every time I see him, I'm like, come on my house. And, and one of the, the oldest, he's like, he's like grown. And so when you coming over, he says, I don't know when we're coming, but when we do, we'll be prepared. <laughs> I was like, Pre prepared? <laughs> scaring me, brother. <laughs> He, he's like, he's just like a, he's just like a grown man. So the other day I'm walking past the house because I just finished running and they were getting in their suburban and I could hear all the screaming, you know, little kids, being little kids. They're fighting over the yellow hat. Whose hat is it? 
And mom was like, their mother was like, get in the seat, blah, you know, just do what we all been through that. So I figured, let me go in there and kind of break the, the drama and talk about the pool. Maybe they'll forget about the hat. So I stick my hand in the car. Hey, what's up, y'all? Where y'all coming? Yes, how you doing? We're coming over to your house and we can't wait. And they're all smiling. And, and I'm like, okay, maybe they forgot about the hat. So I say, all right, see you later. And I walk and all of a sudden the screaming starts. Like, it's my hat. It's my hat. <laughs> There's so many of y'all fighting over the hat. The hat don't mean anything. It really doesn't. Your hat's a career. Your hat's a wife, a girl, a guy, whatever it is. I'm not saying that stuff is meaningless. I'm saying if God wants you to have it, you'll have it. You don't have to scream kick. Just worship God. That's it. We're going to have the worship team come out. We're going to sing a song. But there's some of you who have burdens right now, and I don't have the answer to what's going to happen to tomorrow. I don't have the answer if, if it's happening because of your sin or the devil, whatever. It doesn't really matter. What matters is how you're going to respond to it. And for you to say, Lord, I don't understand, I don't like it, but I'm going to worship you because you are holy. In 1982, I was drafted by the Rams, Los Angeles Rams. They were in Anaheim at the time. And make a long story short, on September 5th, I believe it was, 1982, I was cut from the team, fired, however you want to put it. No, you don't get paid. I was in the hotel on Lincoln Boulevard in Anaheim, and I was crying. God, I want to be on the team. I was good enough to be on the team. I did good. I did good. And God said, the, the Rams are not going to the, they're not going to win but three games this year. <laughs> Come on, man. You don't want to live in Anaheim. <laughs> but what's going to happen, God? Just wait. Then a strike came. There was nobody playing football. It was even worse. Go, what's going to happen now? Oh, take a vacation. You're in California. A lot of brown people out here. Go ride around your top down. And we're trying to get tan. Enjoy yourself, brother. Joy. <laughs> I'll play football. I'll play football. Strike ended. Come on, God. I ran out of money. Uh, I ran out of money. Phone rings. Can you drive to San Diego? We got a tryout. You and two other guys. Next day I was on the charges. God, God said, just wait. Just wait. Trust me. And I wasn't even walking with God. If he was that gracious to me when I wasn't even walking with him, how much more is he going to be gracious when I walk with him? Oh, God has blessed you way more than you deserve. So instead of saying, God, why this, why that, why this, say, God, thank you that I have breath. Thank you when I was in the womb, you supernaturally caused all those trillion chemical reactions that had to happen for me to come out perfectly or however you are conditioned. You're not perfect. You knitted me in the womb. You brought me out of the womb. You fed me. Thank you for all that, God. Thank you that I can understand even to know who you are. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll deal with the other stuff later. Let's sing. We got, we got, here? We got music? We got music? Let's, let's, let's roll the music. Don't go anywhere. We're going to sing a song. Don't go anywhere. We're ready to go. What song are we singing? How great is our, I, I, and my mic is going to go off here, and they'll come on at the end. In reverence to the Father, lift your hands to the Lord. Stand to our feet. Think about the greatness and goodness of our Father. Think about where he's brought us from, where he has us right now, and what we have yet to see him do. We worship you, Jesus. Sing with me, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see. How great, how great. He knows just what you need.
everything you're going through, he knows how to fix it. Sing age to age. Sing with me, age to age. Come on. Age to age, we stand. In time. He's the beginning and the end. Yes, Lord. Every single one of you has a burden. Every single one of you has a pain. Every single one of you has someone in your life with pain. I want to sing one more chorus, and I want you to release that to him. You, you don't have to understand everything. That's the, God doesn't owe you that either. You couldn't handle the truth. <laughs> but what he wants to give you is his love, his encouragement. And he wants to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding where you don't even know, how am I dealing with this? How am I dealing with this? And I'm not going crazy. That's the peace that surpasses all those things. Like being in a house, there's a storm outside, it's raining, sleet, wind, and you're sitting in this peaceful house by the fire going, man, look at all that, but I'm peaceful here. So one more, sing one more chorus, and I want you to release it to God. Let's do it one more time. Let's give it that. Here we go. How great. How great is our God. Sing with me. Jesus, we thank you that your ways are not our ways. They're better. As high as the heavens are above the earth, which we can't count or measure, so are your thoughts above our thoughts and your ways above our ways and your love above our love. Lord, we as mere humans need to trust you. There are times you won't reveal to us why when we want to know why. There are times you will reveal to us, just trust me. And I pray in that dark moment that we would trust you because you've always been faithful, you always will be faithful. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.